Hello and welcome to the Westminster Institute's online series of lectures uh, made necessary by the peculiar circumstances under which we're living now. Delighted to welcome Seth Cropsey uh, to the Westminster Institute. He's a senior fellow and director of the Center for American Sea Power at the Hudson Institute. Seth specializes in defense strategy, U.S. foreign and security policy in the Middle East and East Asia, most importantly on the future of U.S. naval power. He began his career in government in the U.S. Department of Defense as assistant to Secretary of Defense Casper Weinberger and sub subsequently served as Deputy Undersecretary of the Navy in the Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush administrations. Um, in the Bush administration, Seth Cropsey moved to the office of the Secretary of Defense to become acting assistant secretary and then principal deputy assistant secretary of defense for special operations and low intensity conflict. Seth Cropsey served as a naval officer from 1985 to 2004. He also has experience in public diplomacy and uh, served as the director of the editorial office at the Voice of America. Uh, Seth has supervised the agency as successful efforts were undertaken to increase radio and television broadcasting to the Muslim world. This is when he was director of the US government's International Broadcasting Bureau. He's previously been a visiting fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and director of the Heritage Foundation's Asia Studies Center. Seth's articles and monographs on national security and foreign policy have been broadly published. Uh, we are delighted to welcome him today to give us a perspective on U.S. sea power in the Pacific and the challenge of a rising China. Uh Thank you, Bob, for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, I'm happy to be with you today and, and your, uh, your viewers. Uh, be nice to be there in person, but uh, this is life for the time being. So I have some remarks and then I, uh, I look forward to uh, um, trying to answer the questions um, that have come in. Uh, in the meantime, but uh, as they say, let's start from the beginning. The last time that China uh, actively was, a, a, you know, a genuine sea power was in the in the 16th century. An admiral named Zhong He made several voyages from China as far distant as the Horn of Africa, and along the way. He stopped to invade Vietnam with a loss of 30,000 lives, Vietnamese lives, uh, with uh, and demands for tribute from other Indo-Pacific states. And the, the Navy, the fleet, the, the fleets that he commanded were, uh, were serious naval um, vessels, enterprises. Uh, they included large ships, large ships by the standard of, the, of that day and by, by later standards, you know, up to the 19th century, and included, for example, watertight compartments. The Chinese naval architect in the 16th century understood about dividing a ship's hull so that if there was a break in part of the hull, the water that came in would not sink the ship because they could close off parts of it. And uh, just as a reminder about Chinese technology, that, uh, that development didn't uh, begin to arrive in Western ships until the 19th century, until 300 years later. They had single rudders as opposed to a pair of them that had to be maneuvered from the stern and compasses, so it was a it was a a a solid naval enterprise backed up by uh, strong commanders, a strong commander, and uh, good technology. That lasted 
um, until the next emperor. The new emperor decided that naval power was an expensive luxury, a bauble sort of, and he ended voyages and he ended China's maritime focus. What he did instead was he concentrated on consolidating power and expanding uh, the Chinese continental empire. That policy continued more or less uninterrupted through Mao Zedong. Mao wielded absolute power over the Chinese military. No one has done that as successfully until the current general secretary of the Communist Party, Xi Jinping. And Mao was content with a, a small vessel coastal defense force Na coastal naval defense force, really. So things like aircraft carriers or ocean-going destroyers, that wasn't part of the picture. Uh, Mao's successors preserved the Communist Party's political grip on China, but changed the country's economic system so uh, as to allow entrepreneurs um, at the same time that they the Chinese rulers maintained a vast system of state-owned enterprises that's important to Chinese rulers' continuance in power today for the same reasons as it was then, uh, because it employs millions of people. And by the way, whose loans from state banks are largely non-performing. So it's a real drag on their economy, but they find it a necessary one because of the employment that it brings. The US had already played the so-called uh, China card. Uh, that is to say, Kissinger's idea of distracting the Soviets uh, by def befriending China. The policy that Kissinger and Nixon put in place continued long after they left office and up to the current U.S. administration. Um, that is to say, up until this administration, that policy hoped that China's increased economic reforms would somehow lead to political reforms um, increasing demand for political freedom and the incorporation of China into the liberal international order. It's important to remember today that none of this happened, none. For the past 25 years, China has been using a significant part of its growing wealth to become a sea power as well as to maintain its position as Asia's great land power. So let me just give you a thumbnail sketch of what this has done, the, the, the ongoing attempt over the past quarter century uh, to become a sea power, to become both a sea power and a land power, which they already were. So what we see today is a growing surface, a growing surface and submarine force of increasingly modern and capable naval vessels. Um, just to give you as an example, um, when uh, I was a uh, deputy undersecretary of the Navy, uh, and relations between the United States and China were uh, warmer than they are today. Um, one of my colleagues, an assistant secretary of the Navy, went to visit China and um, was shown their, uh, it was spoke with the commander of their submarine forces, who asked him this question, do your crews who return from a patrol on a nuclear powered submarine normally go to the hospital for a period of 30 days for observation to see if there's any sickness from radiation well 
Of course not. Um, but uh, years ago, uh, that was an issue for the Chinese Navy. It's not anymore. They, they've handled that problem. Just a, a, a small example. Um, their accomplishments include uh, um, build the, the construction of one aircraft carrier, the renovation of another, which is used as a training carrier, and a third that's under construction. Uh, accomplishments include large and uh, increasing land-based naval aviation forces that are capable of conducting operations at sea against U.S. and allied navies. Uh, other accomplishments include a large force of anti-surface ship missiles, again, launched by all media from the air, from ships, uh, from, from land. Um, including two missiles, the DF-21 and the DF-26, that are specifically designed to target American carriers underway at a distance of at least a thousand miles. Uh, whether they can do that is not known, but that's what they're aiming to do using um, satellites, um, links with other ships, other of their ships at sea, submarines. Uh, cyber capabilities, uh, and of course the missile itself, which combines the information that it would receive to be able to uh, hit a large deck American uh, naval vessel at a large distance. So what's the short-term strategy here for China? It's to deny the U.S. Navy access to the area within and slightly beyond the first island chain. And uh, for those who might be unfamiliar with the first island chain uh, idea, um, it, is, it is a reference to the islands that uh, bracket China's east coast. So there's a string of islands beginning with Japan island nations, beginning with Japan, uh, including Taiwan, um, including the Philippines, that if you look on a map, you'll see brackets the, uh, the, the Asian mainland at a distance of several hundred miles, in some cases more. Um, and uh, that would Successful control of that area would keep us out um, and would keep us, and the waters, I should, it's important to note that the waters between the first island chain and China are international waters. They're not territorial waters. They don't belong to anybody. Um, but the ability to control those waters, sea power in those waters, sea control in those waters would prevent or greatly complicate uh, the U.S.'s ability, our ability to communicate with our treaty allies like Japan and South Korea, and our, as well as the Philippines, Taiwan, and ultimately, um, as Japan sought to do in World War II with Australia and New Zealand. Uh, China, China's construction of aircraft carriers um, includes those that will equal in size the largest carriers in our fleet. Um, the, we don't know how extensive their aircraft carrier construction program is, but it certainly indicates China's intent to project naval power globally. You don't build an aircraft because you plan to invade uh, Japan or Taiwan, uh, an aircraft carrier, because you have the land-based naval aviation right there. So there's no reason to build aircraft carriers for that. That is not a reason to build aircraft carriers. Projecting power globally is. This idea of global power projection is supported by, uh, by China's investments in port facilities from Myanmar 
to Pakistan, uh, to the Horn of Africa, to Israel, to Greece, to Spain, to the Baltic states, it's global. Uh, Chinese global ambitions are also evident in loans to countries and states especially ones that can't afford to repay like in Africa and Oceania. Um, and Oceania is the sort of the second island chain, the, the, uh, the islands in Micronesia um, that Americans are familiar with because um, of their, uh, of the island hopping campaign that the United States conducted uh, in World War II. Why is that important today? Because seizure and hold, holding those islands and having them on China's side and perhaps using them as bases or port facilities uh, would mean, um, would be a problem for the US Navy if it were to operate closer to China. It would be a problem in their, in their back. Um, so, uh, and a lot of these nations are not able to, as I said, to repay the loans. So the 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 loans themselves have uh, spawned a term called debt diplomacy. You loan the money, and then um, <laughs> you hold the other, you hold the guy who can't pay you back uh, to account for various things that you want. Um, loans to african states for infrastructure that are not paid back result have resulted are resulting in increased chinese leverage there other other examples of china's global understanding of strategy their attempt to sell 5g technology globally uh, to control supply chains of strategic equipment like chips and rare earth minerals they all fit together with international purchases of strategic real estate, and as I was mentioning, port facilities. So the, the strategic aim is to expand the area of strategic competition with the United States and its allies. And this is extremely important so that conflict is everywhere. It's not just limited to traditional forms of kinetic warfare where fleets oppose fleets or airplanes oppose other combat airplanes or armies fight armies. The Chinese see the, the, the battlefield with the United States not as a traditional battlefield, um, but as a, a global one that involves commerce, economy, trade, um, technology, um, everywhere in all those places they seek to advance their um their effort uh to achieve what um general secretary xi jinping uh calls the china dream those are his words china dream china dream is a plan not merely to become the hegemon of asia but to displace the united states as the world's uh great economic power um, as well as replace displace the United States as the world's great military power. So I think it's important to ask yourself this question. What would the world look like if China succeeded? I think it's useful to think about what China has done over the past 20 or 30 years um what would the world look like think about the orwellian surveillance of the chinese people by their government's technical means um think about the brutality of incarcerating millions of uyghurs uh, muslims in, in china's west in concentration camps about the Tiananmen massacre of thousands of students by the supposedly enlightened Chinese leadership of the time. Um, think about China's ongoing threat to use force 
to reunify, as they call it, reunify Taiwan. Um, look at the broken promise uh, that we see today. Uh, the promise to allow Hong Kong the freedoms of its fundamental law. Uh, don't forget uh, China's ongoing international theft of intellectual property, not just in the United States, but in Europe. Uh, consider its illegal claims to the international waters of the South China Sea. And again, its broken promise not to militarize the islands that it illegally seized and built in the South China Sea. You know, China explains and tries to justify these and other violations of international norms and laws with the all inclusive phrase Chinese, Chinese characteristics. If Chinese characteristics become international characteristics, the world's progress toward democratic popular government, government by the people, that began in 1776 will stop and move quickly in reverse. So I want to consider, I'd like to consider for a moment, how and why is sea power so important in the increasingly tense relationship between the United States and China? Sea power and our power to project it, <clears throat> excuse me, reassures our allies around the world, especially by the, uh, the continued presence of our ships in their ports. Our sea power lets our allies know that we can be there to help defend them um, and in a visible way. They're there. It protects the sea lines of communication that are essential for the export of American goods and critical to our economic well being. It gives us the ability to protect American interests abroad and project power internationally and keep crises from approaching our shores. Importantly, it does not depend on arrangements for basing of US forces in other countries. Um, it does depend on logistics ships, and that's another question because we don't have enough of them at this point, but that's subject for a different time. Uh, sea power is important in the form of ballistic missile submarines that, that are the most reliable deterrent against nuclear attack from any enemy because they can't be seen. Um, sea power is essential to the security of any maritime power, and we are a maritime power. Um, and surrounded by oceans uh, and seas on three sides, we've been a maritime power since the Revolutionary War. And speaking of the Revolutionary War and our status as maritime power, uh, it's really important to remember that that was. Our status as maritime power was recognized, recognized by the founders, uh, not only in the Constitution's requirement that uh, the that a navy be maintained as opposed to an army raised as necessary, uh, but also in the decisions of um, Thomas Jefferson, who had not been a navalist before he became president. Um, and had uh, a, uh, a rather, um, I, <clears throat> iconoclast idea that the United States could be protected by uh, a, a large number of small gunboats with one cannon each uh, that would be sort of a Coast Guard. Uh, when he saw what was happening to American shipping in the uh, in the Mediterranean, uh, especially the predations of the the, uh, the Barbary Coast pirates, he changed his mind quickly and started building big, big ships. So the understanding uh, that the United States is a maritime power, that its economy and security depend upon 
uh, maritime power and the ability to project it goes back to the Constitution and our earliest presidents. So, but let's get back to today for a moment. I want to look at what the U.S. has done about China and uh, see if we can say something useful about U.S. strategy today. The 40, for 40 years, the U.S. government policy has been to favor inclusion of China in international organizations. I'm talking about things like what's in the news, the World Health Organization, um, and for example, the World Trade Organization. We gave China uh, most favored nation um, trade status permanently. It used to be renewed, you know, on a yearly or bi-yearly basis uh, in the Clinton administration. Uh, the goal of this U.S. policy put together, it's been to make China what's called a stakeholder, a term repeated by American presidents for decades now a stakeholder in the liberal international order. Um, what can I say? This policy has been the major failure of US foreign policy over the past four decades. The US is gradually, slowly awakening to this today. And it's a complicated task because of our economic relationship with China. We, we get cheap stuff from them. Voters like cheap stuff, understandably. Um, but what are the signs of the awakening? Well, uh, the Pentagon has identified emerging great power competition as the major security cha challenge that faces the US today. Um, and that means China more than anyone else, let's be <clears throat> say at the risk of stating the obvious. The Trump administration has been trying to secure protection against intellectual property theft as part of its trade policy toward China. Uh, in the past few days, uh, a Senate subcommittee <clears throat> issued a highly negative report about Chinese telecoms that operate in the United States. One of the places where there is bipartisan support is the recognition that a bipartisan agreement is the recognition recognition that China is not a friend of the United States and that it presents us with serious and growing challenges to our national security. What's odd uh, is that this uh, this recognition um, has been slow to come to the Defense Department. After three years of uh, Defense Department budget increases that were that helped address the readiness problems that were caused by previous by budget cuts during the previous administration, uh, future increases to the defense budget are extremely small. They are insufficient to keep up with China's naval armaments program. Our defense budget will increase by a tiny increment next fiscal year. Now, you, you might account for this um, by looking at the, considering the huge amounts of money that are being spent to protect the economy during the pandemic. On the other hand, China's GDP is expected to fall by 6.8% this year. The annual Chinese Communist Party meeting that was held uh, last month, late last month, I think it was, uh, approved a military spending increase of 6.6%. So their military budget is going up by about almost exactly the same amount their GDP is expected to decrease. So that's a big problem for us. Uh, if we're not going to build up the fleet, and I say the fleet is important because any future conflict with China, uh, if it comes to that, um, is going to involve uh, uh, the Navy. 
um, it is a naval theater. Uh, we are not going to be conducting land operations on the Asian continent, not in China. Other problems. We have no clearly articulated naval strategy for China. And this, this, makes, this complicates our ability to make intelligent decisions about what kind of changes are needed in the ships we build, um, how the war games that we conduct should be designed, how our forces should be trained, how they should be coordinated with allied forces. Um, and it is not a strategic choice to say, defeat the enemy. That doesn't tell you anything. I mean, it's, it's correct, but it doesn't tell you what to do. Um, and there are competing and not always the same strategic choices. Just to list a few of them, not all of them, that would take a while. Um, one would be to sink Chinese naval and the, or merchant shipping. Um, another would be to blockade China by sea. Um, and as well by the U.S. Marine seizure of choke points uh, between China and the Middle East. In other words, uh, land uh, between which there are waters through which ships must pass if they're going to China or from China, uh, uh, between China and, and the Middle East and Europe. Uh, another possibility is to uh, degrade China's second strike submarine nuclear force. Uh, so there, there are choices, many of them, others that I didn't mention, uh, but there are no articulated decisions, and as a result, it's very difficult to make decisions about, as I said, the fleet architecture, what kinds of ships we build, how we train, how we equip, uh, what kinds of war games we conduct, how we think about um, a, a war with China if such a thing were to break out. Let's hope it doesn't. So. Even if we, and they just put that aside for a moment, even if we were to meet the administration's goal of 355 ships in the next few decades, it would require sustained annual, annual increases in our shipbuilding budgets of about 30% more than the average shipbuilding budgets have been for the past 30 years. That's a lot of money. Um, we haven't shown the willingness to spend it yet. Uh, we haven't made strategic choices and continue along the same path of dividing uh, money between the three uh, services more or less equally, uh, which has not always been done. The Eisenhower administration did it differently, uh, apportioning more money to the Air Force for um, strategic deterrence uh, during the, the early years of the Cold War. And that money came from um, the Army. Uh, and Eisenhower, don't forget, was chief of staff of the Army. So it is possible to make strategic choices in the defense budget. Um, look, uh, I'm not the only person who's saying that we have a problem with China. When the current um the current uh commander of the u.s indo-pacific command admiral davidson uh testified to congress uh a couple of years ago uh he said that if there were a war between uh, a naval contest between the united states and china that it was impossible to predict the outcome. Now you might say, okay, so it's always impossible to predict the outcome, but that's a rather strong statement made two years ago uh, by a senior admiral um, who was going to, who is now responsible for uh, our forces um, from, uh, you know, in the Western Pacific and the Indo-Pacific. Notwithstanding, uh, the American people, I think, 
are uh, they are not aware that China is seriously challenging the status that we've held since World War II as a dominant as the world's dominant sea power, and all of that put together um, makes for uh, a troubling situation. Uh, and I, I'm happy to try to answer questions uh, that you have. Yeah. In what way is the United States Navy uh, undergoing measures to counter the new hypersonic anti-ship missiles that China purportedly has, uh, several of which uh, could take out an American carrier? Where uh, the United States is uh, working on is building has a hypersonics missile program in place. We will have hypersonic missiles, um, and uh, I expect they'll be very good ones. No one has uh, successful defense against them, and more investment is needed um in the research uh that's needed to protect against hypersonic missiles when i asked a former senior admiral uh, what would be the consequences for the u.s navy of these chinese hypersonic missiles <clears throat> he said simply that the navy would have to stand off a further distance beyond their range uh, but it would seem to me all the Chinese have to do is keep increasing the range, and pretty soon the U.S. Navy's out of the picture. Uh, well, yes and no. Uh, if we do not develop defenses against hypersonics, um, it would be the first example um i know of in history where one weapon system new weapon system has not been countered by newer technology so i have i'm confident that we will develop those uh, but not as of yet but we don't but they're not there now yeah. um and at the same time when we have the hypersonic missiles themselves uh let's assume which is a reasonable assumption that they can be launched from uh from land bases uh from ships and from uh and from airplanes from from the air force by the air force so uh that exposes a, at least an equal vulnerability in china uh so uh that should not be ignored in thinking about this question. If it, if we had no hypersonic missiles and they had an, an, an enemy had them, we'd be in a much worse position than if we were able to retaliate uh, by causing equal damage uh, with the same missiles. And may I ask, how significant are the advantages China has gained through its militarization of the artificial islands it's built in the South China Seas? Well, the the um, they've succeeded in uh, in violating a in getting away with violating a um an international principle of uh freedom of navigation on the seas on the on international seas that's probably the biggest achievement um the little islands that they built and the little islands that they occupied and put military forces on uh are more effective in substantiating their claim to the international waters during peace than they are if conflict broke out because mm -hmm. those little places are not they're not strongholds um they're not easily defended if for other if for no other reason because of their size and so they would be vulnerable in a conflict
Mm -hmm. uh, you already alluded to China's vulnerability regarding uh, certain sea lanes, uh, which abut uh, countries friendly to the United States, if not outright allies. <clears throat> Can you speak a little more about how we are taking advantage of those vulnerabilities, uh, leveraging those vulnerabilities? Uh, leveraging the vulnerabilities of uh, I, I didn't I, I didn't get it all, Bob. Well, I mean, it seems apparent that China is is showing its muscle, uh, letting the countries in the south and east asia know that it's the boss right uh, and but however uh, as you alluded china has certain vulnerabilities in sea lanes that are vital to it for instance yeah. receiving its oil and yes. so forth yes but yes. it's not it's not in control of yeah. and uh Whereas it's flexing its muscles, is the United States and its allies or friendly countries thinking of emphasizing to China its vulnerabilities yeah, in yeah, that respect? Yeah, I, just, I, I got it. I got it. Okay. So okay. Uh, excellent. Um, uh, <clears throat> so this is what I was. So what, what do we do? We conduct freedom of navigation operations. We've been able to get some allies to do the same thing. There's growing awareness in Europe that this is a problem for them as well. Uh, that's all good stuff. Um, uh, but the answer to your question lies in the, the, the issue that I discussed about articulating a strategy we have not articulated a strategy anything like mm. the strategy that we did during the the cold war um where uh the so-called maritime strategy of the time uh said and practiced and trained and built ships and planes for the express purpose of exploiting the Soviets' vulnerabilities in the North and in the Mediterranean and in the Pacific by going after their port facilities, uh, by going after their bastions of, uh, of ballistic missile submarines, um, and by generally speaking, distracting attention from the Central Front. That was a strategy. Uh, if they had if they had problems on their northern and southern flanks from the sea and on their Pacific flank from the sea, it would uh, mean a distraction of effort from the central front um, concentrating on the fold again. We have not articulated a strategy like that. I think that um, the correct approach here is to ask ourselves, what is it that China values most? And I think the answer to that is that what the Chinese rulers value most is their continuance as Chinese rule, as China's rulers. And that depends upon uh, the ability of the Chinese economy to perform and the perception among the Chinese population that their rulers uh are providing them with a better life and a more prosperous one if china's ability to export and to import and to import raw materials and export finished goods is choked interrupted or stopped then the deepest questions about that continuance of that prosperity are raised that's why it seems to me that uh, sinking their naval fleet and going after their merchant ships and making it impossible for them to export and import by every means that we have in our control, including uh, uh, holding the choke points through which ships pass, um, 
make sense as a strategy. We don't have one yet. What do you see as a public diplomacy strategy? <clears throat> you were once involved in public diplomacy in your work at the Voice of America. It seems China has already reached the stage of strength where it can, through economic means, <clears throat> effectively intimidate its neighbors or attempt to, as it has Australia, when Australia asked for an investigation, mm -hmm. it, it cuts Australian imports. Um, uh, it, or it'll sink some uh, fishing boats uh, and put uh, the Philippines in its place, which now no longer wishes to have joint operations with U.S. troops. Uh, is is there is there anything short of the naval strategy that you are espousing uh, that that yeah, might yeah. help yeah, yeah. part of an overall strategy? Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I I didn't mean to say that we we should. No, I, I I I was trying to say exactly the opposite. That we we should not rest our. Uh, <clears throat> We should not depend simply upon uh, military forces as uh, as a defense against what China is trying to do, um, but that um, their efforts were to turn the whole world into a battlefield, um, uh, economically, commercially, diplomatically, financially, in every way, uh, technologically. Um, so uh, I think that. Um, the current administration's effort to uh, uh, prevent friends and allies from using Chinese 5G technology is um, is, is sensible, is good, um, is part of what Vice President what Vice President Pence called uh, when he spoke at Hudson almost two years ago, a uh, whole government approach to uh, to China. I think that whole government approach. I think he's right, um, and that that's what's required. Uh, building, uh, strengthening relations between the United States and its allies and partners, in especially in Asia, is extremely important. I think that um, we can do a lot more for Taiwan than we have done, um, and that measures that ought to be considered include include recognizing Taiwan more. Uh, coordination with Japan um, in the form of combat information centers that um, allow the easy transmission of data and communications between the two forces. But, uh, but on the diplomatic side, there has, has not been a more important moment for us to reconsider the conventional wisdom about the that maintains that there that a a coalition or an a, a, an alliance um, of countries in Asia is impossible. Um, it may not be possible, but I think it's definitely worth the effort. And I hear more and more people from Asia saying exactly the same thing. Um, and I mean, people from countries that have not always been on friendly terms with Japan and whose memories extend back clearly to World War II. When they start saying that some kind of a, a greater coherence is needed and greater cooperation and possibly even um, a formal arrangement, that's the sign that we ought to be taking leadership and trying to form one. If I may ask a last question, Seth, I asked an Asian expert, uh, well, why didn't China, why didn't President Xi simply wait another five, 10 years, uh, by which time it most likely would be too late, would have been too late for the United States to react in any uh, substantive way that would have uh, had the potential to thwart the, uh, the China dream? And the response I got was, you know, just keep that low profile, which had been China's uh, strategy for some time, and hide your strength. The, the response I got was, well, they already think the United States 
has reached the point of weakness that they can't do anything about it. Now, do, do you do you agree that that's China's assessment of the situation and of the condition of the United States? Or have they misjudged us? I can't prove it, but I agree. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody can prove it. Maybe the intelligence services can prove it, but yeah, I think that they've uh, that um, our uh, our failure to take uh, stronger measures has been has induced them, has, has encouraged them uh, to accelerate the timetable, uh, to be more aggressive, um, weakness or indecision or hesitation, call it what you want, some combination of them, always does the same thing. It encourages aggression, and that's what we're seeing. And, and in turn, that aggression has incited finally a response from the United States, which you earlier had characterized as bipartisan. Uh, in other words, they've provoked the very thing that they would normally have wished to avoid and maybe they're not worried about it because they think the uh, United States is, is too far gone to seriously challenge China now. <clears throat> well, I don't share that opinion, but I certainly can understand how, it could, how the Chinese could reach that conclusion. I think if there were, um, that's what I, I ended my, uh, my remarks uh, a moment ago uh, by, talking specifically about the American, you know, Americans' understanding of China and more, you know, equally important, um, the misunderstanding that uh, we remain the unchallenged uh, dominant global naval power. Mm. Um, if we continue to think that and don't realize What's, what's been happening year by year at an accelerating rate, um, things will go very badly. But um, there is the possibility, and I'm not a pessimist, but there is the possibility that um, that, that, that that bipartisan, growing bipartisan understanding uh, of the threat that China poses uh, will lead to more uh, strategic decisions about the defense budget, uh, more strategic decisions about our, what our defense policy is uh, and what to be, and uh, certainly um, a, a greater appreciation for the importance of, um, of whole government solutions, of uh, an understanding that the competition that we have with China um, goes far beyond the military one, and that our policy needs to recognize that. Do you foresee a curtailment of cooperative actions with allied navies like Japan, South Korea, Australia, or others in order to limit the spread? Of, if so, how would that affect interoperability, such as joint exercises or port visits with allied forces? and the U.S. Navy's general preparedness for conflict in response to China's growing aggressive actions. Yeah, I don't think that, uh, that, the, uh, that the problems that, that the Navy has had uh, are likely to um, decrease uh, joint exercises with other countries, you know. Their ship is over here, and our ship is over here, and you're not going to get over, you know, a thousand yards of, of water. So I don't see that as a problem. Uh, poor visits, yeah, that could be a problem. Um, and uh, more testing, um, and uh, is is one answer to that. Um, making sure that crews are um, practice the distancing um, and other recommendations of the um, of the government and certainly requirements of the military uh, is 
one alternative, um, not alternative, it's what's, it's what's going to happen, it's what's happening already. Um, but it's important to remember one thing, and that is that, um, first of all, the, a couple of things. First of all, that the, the population of the people who are aboard ships are in the lowest, have the lowest vulnerability to, notwithstanding the fact that it can be passed, um, and that the, among, you know, 20 year olds or 20 to 30 year olds. Um, and the other is that the, the problems with the Roosevelt came up during peacetime. And that was a large fulcrum. That was the fulcrum in the dispute, um, in the, 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 the issue of what to do about the, the Roosevelt. You remember that the argument was of the captain, the commanding officer, was that taking these risks during peacetime that could result in death um, was questionable. While if there were a war going on, um, it's something. It's something that uh, it would be a different matter. Uh, so um, I, I and I think that's a reasonable position. Um, and I'm trying to make the answers here short. Uh, I'm confident that the that the military and the Navy in particular are going to handle the problem. Um, and I'm not concerned about um, relationships with allies suffering as a result. If if no if for no other reason a ship could um, a U.S. ship could enter a foreign port and just be there and be seen there um, without any of the sailors going ashore, which would disappoint the crews mightily. Uh, but it would, by our presence, demonstrate our support. How aggressive do you think China will be with its new carrier force? Will it play a support role or will it become the centerpiece of their naval strategy? I don't know. Uh, I think that the <clears throat> I raised that question in my remarks and I, and um, and the fo and the, and I appreciate the follow. -up. Um, it depends upon how many carriers they build and when they've when they've learned what they need to know in order to operate carriers effectively. It will depend upon how they operate the carriers. Are they going to be deployed to the Mediterranean? Um, if they are, then we're going to see, then there will be, need to be a large buildup of aircraft carriers in order to support that. Because three aircraft carriers or X number of aircraft carriers in a fleet does not mean X number of aircraft carriers deployed. In order to keep one carrier uh, permanently on station anywhere in the world, we need a few. We need one that's training, getting ready to replace them after their six month deployment. And we usually need one in, uh, in intermediate maintenance. And we often need one in refueling, which takes several years and costs a lot of money. Uh, so uh, the answer to that is going to emerge as China's aircraft carrier construction program develops. The more they build, the clearer it will become that they're building them in order to project power globally, which is what I think they're doing. But the evidence is waiting. Why is China choosing now to encroach upon Hong Kong? What does this reveal about their intentions and interests? Um, <laughs> actually, it doesn't reveal anything. Um, what we already knew um, <laughs> is that China is extremely uncomfortable um, at the prospect of uh, any challenge to its empire. And China considers Hong Kong part of its empire, notwithstanding its promise to honor the fundamental law, the basic law, uh, which allowed the continuance of uh, 
Hong Kongers' freedoms for 50 years after 1999. So I don't think we've learned anything um, we didn't already know, which is that the Chinese leaders are deeply insecure and that any sign of democracy or independence or, uh, or freedom in places that China considers as part of its empire is keeps Xi Jinping and his colleagues awake at night.